Hi, and welcome back to some of my videos for recertification for CEU hours. Um, this one is on the trauma section, and this is a five part um, video or set of videos. The trauma requires trauma triage, which is triaging patients to the appropriate facilities, not mass casualty triage. That's half an hour. Hemorrhage control, another half an hour, and then CNS injuries, half an hour. So that's an hour and a half. This is These five parts are actually going to come out just about two hours because I feel that trauma assessment is not given a place in this or enough of a place in this. I don't think you can cover all the, all the things that are necessary in these three topics in an hour and a half and include uh, some basic trauma assessment. Uh, trauma care starts with assessment. So there'll be 0.5 hours of trauma assessment in there that you can use for your personal hours for National Registry. So I'm gonna switch over here to my screen, to my desktop for the PowerPoints and we'll start with part one. Okay, so uh, part one, uh, this is trauma. I've done this program or variations of it all over the state. I've done it for New Hampshire EMS a couple of times, and I've, I've narrowed it down. I've cut it down uh, for this because, again, I'm trying to fit everything I can into an hour and a half, <clears throat> and it's just it's hard for me to do that. <clears throat> I typically spend about two hours on uh, trauma class. So part one, um, Elmo, you know, tickle me one more time and I'll shank you and your whole family. I try to find little places to put funny little things like this in. But this is what we're talking about. We're talking about trauma. We're talking about uh, blunt trauma. We're talking about penetrating trauma. And for the most part, when we talk about hemorrhage control and tourniquets and hemostatics, we're talking about penetrating. So as I said before, this is the uh, breakdown or the requirement for this. Now, tunnel vision, I've, I talked about that with situational awareness in the NCCP uh, 101 and uh, safety. Uh, tunnel vision is just as important in patient care as it is in um, situational awareness of a safety um, aspect. So, you need to keep an overall picture of your patients. If you get distracted by a gross injury or a distracting injury, as they call them, uh, you may not see what's really killing them. You know, um, and we're going to talk about that more with our assessments. But I just I want to start off with this: if if all you're seeing is the peak in the middle, you're not seeing everything around it. Now, blunt trauma. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is a quote from a emergency physicians program at the UCLA Medical Center uh, College for uh, um, emergency physicians, and its physical exam findings are notoriously unreliable. One reason is mechanisms of injury often result in other injuries that may divert the physician's attention. From potentially life-threatening intra-abdominal pathology. Other reasons, alter mental status, and of course drugs and alcohol. So these ER physicians have, you know, 12, 13 years of school at the time of, of, of college level, doctorate level education by the time they get to this. We're doing this, you know, with 150 hours as an EMT student another 150 or so as an AEMT student, and then another 14, 15, 1600 as a paramedic. Um, so if it's this important for the UCLA Medical School to tell their ER physician students this, we really need to think about this, okay? We know that drugs and alcohol alter sensation. Um, and there are lots of things that will show up that will will distract us from this. 
okay? So UCLA School of Medicine. Now, are these distracting injuries? Absolutely. You know, this arm, um, very, if, if this does not involve a um, artery that, you know, could lead to exanguination, exanguination, sorry, and bleeding to death, um, and it's just a lot of kind of slow oozing, that may not be the priority here. The flail segment, the hole in the chest, the hole in the belly, um, the hole in the neck, those are things that will kill her first. So don't let these sorts of injuries distract you. Now this knife could be the deadly injury, or it could be one that is just, it's something we need to worry about, but it may not be what kills this person first, okay? Now, if you look at this, this is that same person. You know, if you look at the red bra on the left picture, when you look at the abdomen, you can see the red bra. So, you know, which one do we see first and, and which one's gonna kill him first? That arm might have a large vessel and while you're worrying about stabilizing that knife, um, she bleeds to death. So don't be distracted. Look at the whole picture. What's gonna kill him first? Remember, do not develop tunnel vision. And that other program I said that I've worked with some uh, EMS providers and physicians who I think could be amongst the best in their field. But because they tunnel vision in on things, um, it makes them piss poor providers, okay? So please don't tunnel vision. <clears throat> All right, so on to CNS injuries. Let's review a few basic things. So, uh, oh crap. So Glasgow Coma Scale, um, why are we going over this? This is, you know, it's in our books. We were all taught it, but we God, we don't use this, right? Our Tempsis or our Easy PCR or whatever we use automatically um, documents this for us. Well, I got news for you. If you go into a trauma center now, um, they ask for this. You know, I've taken patients into um, trauma team activations at Portsmouth Hospital here in New Hampshire, Portsmouth Hospital, um, the Elliott Hospital. Concord Hospital and Dartmouth. And I have been asked on mild trauma patients, they weren't even trauma alerts, much less activations, but if it's a trauma patient, do you have a Glasgow coma scale on this patient? Or, hey, what's their coma score? And it's kind of embarrassing to go, uh, 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 stand by a minute and then try to figure it out, okay? Um, have an idea of how this works. I, verbal, and motor, okay? four, five, and six. Um, what I recommend people do is you cut one of these out and you tape it on the wall in your ambulance next to the microphone. It will remind you to do this before you pick up the damn radio. And that way you're not caught unawares because you know they're laughing at you in the ER. Ah, he didn't even think about that, All right? <clears throat> so if I'm going into a trauma center with a trauma patient, I start my patch out with, hey, we're en route to your facility conscious alert times three. 24-year-old uh, male patient, initial Glasgow was 14. With this injury, this mechanism, this exam, these are the treatments I've done. Um, and currently, um, his Glasgow is up to 15. ETA is 10 minutes, any questions, okay? Get it right out in the beginning. You'll look like a hero. Literally, when you walk into an ER, they will go, oh man, that was a great report. Nobody ever thinks of the coma score, okay? So, they are expecting it. They use it as a tool for trending. You know, what was it in the field? What is it right now? What is it when they hit the ER? What is it, you know, it's a, it's a big trending tool for them, okay? Um, and there's the old, um, the old adage of uh, less than eight intubate. You know, you have a patient who opens their eyes to pain, that's a two. They're not making any sense though when they reply, that's a, two, so that's four, and um, they, you know, when you wake them up and say, hey, can you move your left arm, and they do it, that's six, so that's a score of 10, but they're not there, you know? Um, but if you, hey, 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 and you're loud, and they open their eyes, and they're not making sense, and they're a four, and you ask them to move an arm, and they don't, but you poke an IV in them, and they jerk their arm away, 
that's a five, that's a nine, all right? Um, if they withdraw from the pain, as opposed to moving away from the pain, that's only a four, that's an eight. You know, these guys need advanced airway maneuvers, okay? Now, <clears throat> with that, you add our Glasgow into a revised trauma score. And I haven't been asked for this in any of the trauma centers, but this is certainly something that trauma systems use to trend, uh, the state uses it to trend. Um, and so your Glasgow goes in accordingly. Uh, what's their blood pressure and what's their respiratory rate? Now, when we talk about deciding where a trauma patient goes, respiratory play, rate, sorry, plays a huge part in this. Abnormal respiratory rates um, are a big deal with trauma patients. Again, we'll get more into that. <clears throat> so what do we look for with a head CT? Um, so when you're looking at your patient, I want you to think about these head CTs in the back of your, your mind. You know, when you see the mechanism of injury and when you see their presentation, I want you to think about what could be causing this. Okay, not just, oh, it's a head bleed. Well, what are different bleeds? What do they do? Okay, so this is a normal one. And if you look, um, all the gray matter goes out evenly all the way around the edge of the skull. The two little semicircular um, uh, areas in the center are perfect. And there's a little white line that runs from the top to the bottom. That's midline. That's the dividing line between the, the two halves. And that runs straight up and down right in the middle. It doesn't bulge one way or the other. So that's a normal head CT. <clears throat> now, we look at types of brain hemorrhage. Um, and this is off Wikipedia. I don't know where it came from originally, but this is a very good little drawing of this. And it shows us the different layers and levels of meninges and covering. So meninges are just covering within the skull, protecting the brain. So you've got the skull, and then the first layer you have is the dura mater, okay? Now, if you notice the dura mater, if we look right at the top center, you can see underneath it the arachnoid mater and the um, pia mater under that. And you can see it actually comes down into the separation between the two halves. It isn't just one big bag that holds the brain. If you come down that right side as you're facing it, you see it comes down by the ear and then makes a dive in towards the center, okay, on both sides. So um, it's not just one big bag, okay. Now what we look at, and, and I've got a couple of slides to show some CTs here in a minute, but an epidural, um, we've got subdurals, we've got subarachnoids, and we've got intracerebral. Now, where those are tells you where the bleed is. So an epidural is above the dura mater. So it's between that outermost lining and the skull. Uh, and this information on, on um, epidurals comes from the UCLA neuro, uh, neurology folks. Um, but it's typically caused by a skull fracture, which tears that vessel. It's about half as common as a subdural. Subdural is probably the most common traumatic injury. Um, and here's a surprise. Skull fractures and torn vessels, men are four times more likely to have that than women <laughs> because men do stupid shit. Here, hold my beer, right? Um, uh, let me do a wheelie and show off for that girl over there. Bam! And hit your head on the pavement, um, fracture your skull. Okay. Now, an epidural presentation wise typically you have a brief loss of consciousness they get knocked out they wake up they're fully lucid in other words um completely alert oriented um they know what happened where they are who they are right conscious alert and oriented times four uh, or three whatever you prefer to use right person place time and events then after this period of lucidness they have a decreasing uh, level of consciousness until um, basically um, unresponsive coma, whatever term you want to use, um, followed by increasing pressure and possibly death. Now, what's a treatment for that epidural? Typically, if it's small, and their definition of small is less than one centimeter 
at its widest point. Small, less than one centimeter, with basically no real significant symptoms. Minor headache, yeah, okay. Um, no pressure building, no symptoms of pressure building. They'll usually watch it and let it reabsorb. Uh, the body reabsorb that, that pool of blood. Anything over a centimeter, severe headaches, any sort of deficit, they make a cut, they go in, they remove that clot. Now, a subdural, and this information comes from the Cleveland Clinic. There are three levels or three classifications, <coughs> excuse me, of subdurals, acute, subacute, and chronic. Now, an acute is the worst one. And this bleed, so underneath the dura mater, between the dura mater and the arachnoid mater, tend to be small veins, okay? An acute one is the worst one. These are the biggest veins, the biggest amount of bleeding, and symptomatically, um, it only takes a few minutes to a couple of hours to become symptomatic. Acute ones in a trauma center with neuro tend to do okay because um, they can do a burr hole, drain that out, let off the pressure. Okay. Now, that's acute. Typically traumatic, but it could be um, a um, an aneurysm. Okay, something along those lines. A subacute is probably the majority of our younger trauma patients, and what I mean by that is it takes hours up to weeks for their symptoms to occur. Um, you walk into a house and somebody um, has the worst headache of their life. Uh, and they're puking their guts out, uh, and they do not have migraines. They've never had a headache like this. Um, first thing I say to them is, hey, in the last two months, have you been in any accidents? Have you hit your head? Have you fallen down? And most of them can tell you that. Uh, boy, you know, now that I think about it, a couple of weeks ago or a month ago, whatever, I, I fell down the stairs. It's a subdural. They're going to a trauma center, okay? Um, now, these subacutes can also occur with what we typically think of as concussions because it is a slow bleed. And even if they go to the ER, they get a CAT scan a couple of hours after the event and it's negative. Remember, this can happen out over weeks. Um, kind of the typical subacute is six weeks, up to six weeks. Okay. <clears throat> the last um, classification is called chronic. These can be out to months weeks or months. They're generally older people. A lot of them have what we call atrophy, where the brain has started to shrink a little bit and it's pulled blood vessels tighter within the brain so that when you get this sloshing back and forth from a fall, you tear one of these small vessels. And it's a very slow bleed. Again, it can go out to months. It's so far away, in fact, that most of these people, and so minor, in fact, that most of these folks don't even remember the event. Now, what are the signs and symptoms with a subdural? Headaches, um, slow building up to crushing headaches. Uh, as that gets worse, more confusion or confusion, some drowsiness, uh, nausea and vomiting is very um, typical with the pain involved with this, some slurred speech, some visual changes, and uh, if you're an infant, um, bulging fontanelles, because remember, you've got bleeding going on, it's increasing pressure, and these fontanelles will start to bulge. With an infant, if you're looking at their, their soft spots, their fontanelles, and they're screaming because they're colicky, they're screaming because they're scared, they don't know who you are, they want their mom, whatever it is, um, they're hungry, um, they've got a diaper full, you see that little bit of bulging in the fontanelles, that's to be expected. When they calm down, mom sticks a, a binky in the kid's mouth, stops crying, calms down, those fontanelles should go back to normal. Okay? Fontanelles that have sunken are uh, typically from dehydration or hemorrhage, okay? but bulging fontanelles. So the risk factors with these subdurals, older folks with the atrophy, um, if you think about any of the C-spine assessment and rule out um, exams, they all say, hey, take extra care in patients over 65. If you, you know, when we talk about trauma activations, patients over 65, okay, they have atrophy in the brain, 
they, they have a higher risk of head bleeds, uh, subdural especially. Contact sports, certainly, you know, we know that from football and rugby and soccer and all those things. If they're on blood thinners, right, because if they get a small tear, it does not clot as easy, so it will bleed more. Hemophiliacs who have clotting factor issues, alcoholics uh, and others, you know, who just abuse alcohol on a regular basis, because the liver is what creates some of these uh, clotting proteins. So if the liver is uh, damaged, it doesn't produce these proteins as well. And then babies, because they have weak necks, um, that old um, shaken baby syndrome, you know, you pick the kid up and you won't stop screaming and, and they shake them and they yell, oh, wow, will you just shut up? And they put the kid back down. Well, the head's sloshing around and we've torn vessels and now we have some of these um, um, head bleeds. So then we look at um, a subarachnoid. A subarachnoid, this info is from uh, the Mayo Clinic. And subarachnoids are between the brain itself and the arachnoid membrane. So subdural below, right? Um, subarachnoid below. <clears throat> These can be certainly trauma. The other thing that um, contributes to subarachnoids, and in this one on the video, you can see it's one of those areas where that um, arachnoid uh, matter goes down into one of the crevices in the brain, and, it, and it's in that location. Okay, so it's kind of deep down into the skull. So aneurysms are a big one. And then what they call AV malformations, arteriovenous malformations which have been described as an abnormal tangle of vessels. So it's almost like a um, fistula um, that ends up bleeding. Right? Now, <clears throat> how do they diagnose these? CAT scans, MRIs. Now, according to Mayo, one of the kind of scary things I didn't know about is that almost 22% of subarachnoid bleeds do not show up in the initial imaging but they still have this crushing headache, right? And so they end up getting a lumbar puncture and the lumbar puncture shows some blood in it. Um, and so then they repeat films, they repeat it the next day kind of thing, or they do the MRI and it shows up. Now, as far as treatment for that, it's, it's surgical. Um, they go in and they clip off aneurysms, they clip off vessels, they put coils in kind of like a, um, you know, you think about a stent for a, um, for a uh, STEMI, for example, well, they go in and they put um, coils and stents in for this also. And then your intracerebral is just vessels within the brain that get um, damaged. Um, remember, we talk in EMT 101 uh, under head injuries about coup contra coup. So when you fall off your skateboard and you land head first, forehead first on the pavement, that coup injury is that banging of the brain straight into the front of your skull and then as you go back your your you know your brain sloshes back and hits the back side of your skull that's your contra coup injury so you've got coup contra coup as well um, and everything in between so <clears throat> epidural is kind of a lens shaped um bleed that's what it looks like and you can see on the outside of the skull you can see um some some bleeding also that's that's bruising um, from where the impact was. Subdural, um, again, acute subdurals tend to have a high mortality rate. Your sub subacute and your chronics tend to be fairly well tolerated if picked up on ahead of time. And the brain in a lot of uh, cases, um, on the acute, on the subacute and chronics, a lot of times uh, the brain or the body just reabsorbs that pool of blood back in. Uh, and your subarachnoid, this one looks like, oh, it's in the dead center of the brain. Why isn't this an intracranial? Well, because it's within or below that arachnoid matter where it has come in along one of those fissure points. Now, <clears throat> a concussion. Uh, this is a normal CAT scan. But how, is, how does he have a normal CAT scan if it's a concussion? That's the deal. A concussion is a stunning of the brain without any evidence of bleeding, swelling, lacerations, etc. Okay. If you take your non-dominant hand, in this case my left hand, 
I make a fist with my right and I punch my left hand as hard as I can. When you do that, you get this numbness and tingling and pinpoint sensation in the hand. But when I look at my hand, there's no bleeding, there's no swelling. Um, nothing that would show up on imaging, right? Maybe it's a little red right at the impact area. Um, those pinpoint sensations, that numbness, that tingling, the paresthesias as it's called, <clears throat> that basically is a concussion of your hand. That's the same thing that happens to your brain, okay? Now, can they have a loss of consciousness with this? Oh, certainly. Um, can they have some knowledge and vomiting with it? Absolutely, okay? But the brain itself doesn't have anything that you can point at on imaging and say, oh, that's the injury. Lack of that finding makes this a concussion. Now, why should we in EMS reinvent the wheel? Let's look at what the NFL is doing, right? You think back um, into the early 2000s between the military with Iraq and Afghanistan looking at um, veterans coming home having horrific post-concussive um, symptoms. Um, and the NFL is starting to look at, uh, geez, why did uh, Mike Webster die in his mid, early to mid-50s homeless, right? The guy... He wasn't broke. He had a home he could live in. Um, Pittsburgh Steelers Center Hall of Famer, right? Um, he kind of one of the impetuses of their investigation into this. So why reinvent the wheel? Um, why not? You know, let's look at what the NFL is using. So they have this assessment tool, right? They go in underneath the uh, the ice fishing uh, hut that they fold out during the game, and they do this assessment. And the first part of this I like quite a bit. Um, you know, did they have any loss of consciousness? Do they have any unresponsiveness? Do they have any confusion initially or now? Um, do they have any amnesia? So retrograde, anterograde. Um, can they recall the events before the hit? Can they call, recall the events after the hit? Do they have either new symptoms or persistent ones like headache, nausea, dizziness? Any abnormal neurological findings? So along with questioning, they do a neuro assessment, right? Um, Hey, squeeze my fingers. Um, do you have good strength up and down on your wrist? Kind of, you know, uh, just a good neuro assessment. Can you feel me? What finger am I touching? Is it sharp or dull? They do that with the feet. They look at the pupils, okay? Um, do they have any progressive, persistent, or worsening injuries? You also have to consider cervical spine or a worsening brain injury. Hey, right now, this is great. This is stuff that we should be doing on our simple um, you know, on, on our patient assessment of this MVA. Um, do they have deteriorating mental status? Do they have neck pain, cervical spine tenderness, decreased range of motion? How are their pupils? How are their equal ocular movements? Uh, are, are, are their extraocular movements equal? Um, are they normal? Um, do they have any asymmetric um, uh, findings? Um, and then, hey, orientation. What month? What day? What's the date? What year is it? About what time is it right now? So, you know, these guys know that, well, the game started at one, we're in the first quarter. I don't know, it's 120, 130, something like that. Okay. Where are we? Do you know what quarter it is? Who scored last? Right. These guys are keeping up on this game because they got to know when they're coming in, what, what, you know, what their role is in it. Okay. And then they do some word recall. And uh, this is starting to get a little much for me. Um, on the sidelines, I think it's great when they're making a decision, does this player go back in the game or do they not go back in the game? Um, we're not making that decision, okay? Um, now this King device is a pre-injury score and a post-injury score. So they have the eyes track numbers and patterns and can they do it beforehand? Um, and then they have them, um, uh, so this is like during preseason, they do this and they time them. And then after the injury, they do it and they time them. Any noticeable difference in time, boom, concussion. All right, we're not doing this in the field. Um, we certainly don't have access to these folks beforehand, but this is what they're using or one of the tools they're using. So for us, <clears throat> when we look at what they just talked about and what they, they're doing, you know, dazed or stunned, Did, you know, lights are on, nobody's home. I mean, if you watch the, um, what was it, the AFC championship game, 
right? Um, when um, the Kansas City Chiefs quarterback got hit, he was out. He was out on his feet. When they helped him stand up, there was nobody home, okay? Dazed or stunned. Yep, he was. Um, confusion about events. Hey, um, where were you going when this happened? Hey, do you know what happened? Uh, I think I was in a car accident. Okay, um, where were you going? Where were you coming from? Okay, the big one, the repetitive questions. You know, what happened, where am I? What happened, where am I? When you ask them a question, are they quick with the answer or are they slow to answer? The retrograde, anterograde amnesia questions, right? They don't know what, where they were going. They don't know where they were coming from. Um, they don't know what happened after the event. Um, who are you, how'd you get here? Where am I, okay? Uh, any brief loss of consciousness. Now, behavior and personality changes, we don't know this but you can certainly ask their family members, <clears throat> right? I went on a call yesterday that was toned out as a stroke and I walk in and the dude's got left-sided facial droop, significant facial droop and um, speech is thick and slurred. Um, is this his norm? Oh no, he's had this for five years since his last stroke. Okay, do you notice anything different about him now than you did before you called 911? No, he's exactly the same, perfect. Now, I had a big concussion when I was 18 after a motor vehicle accident. Broke my neck, um, huge concussion. It was in the uh, my senior year in high school. And uh, every day, every day, and I think it was fifth period, um, which was an independent living class, teaching kids how to get ready to move out on their own. I'd be sitting there and I couldn't remember what my next class was. Um, I knew where I was. I knew what time of day it was. I knew what period it was. I could not remember where I went for sixth period. And uh, this happened for two months, the last two months of school. Um, and I'd, I'd stop and, and my classmates and the teacher would recognize what was about to happen. Because I just kind of stop and I kind of look left. And then I kind of look right. And somebody would go, Kevin, you're going to math next. Math, math. Second floor, go up the stairs, take a right. Oh, yeah, 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 thanks. Every day. So class assignments, class schedule. Um, the one good thing about that concussion, I had to write everything down. The best grades I had in high school were after that concussion because I wrote stuff down and checked it off as I did it, but could not remember every day. Now, headache or pressure in the head, nausea, vomiting. Now, with nausea and vomiting, it's normal after you hit your head, even without a concussion, just, oh, puke once or twice or be a little nauseous, you know? What we worry about is consistent or persistent nausea or vomiting or worsening nausea and vomiting. Those folks, if they sign off at the scene and they're a little nauseous, but they tell you, nope, I'm not going, and you've given them the warning signs for TBI, right, traumatic brain injury, you gotta tell them, hey, if, if your nausea doesn't get any better or if you start to vomit, or if you're vomiting, you vomited once now, but later on you keep puking, you need to call 911 again, okay? Balance problems, dizziness, uh, fatigue, uh, vision problems, right? We talked about that from um, either Mayo Clinic or Cleveland Clinic. Uh, light sensitivity, sensitivity noise. These are all typical signs of concussion. And what they found after the military and the NFL kind of got together and started looking at this is that these things last months. Months and months in some people. And the more the more concussions you have, the worse the symptoms become and the longer they last and the more debilitating they are. <clears throat> Irritability, um, sad, depressed, emotional, nervous, scared. Okay. Now, the state of New Hampshire, in case you don't know this, they have a um, file online that you can go in and it's um, recommended um, documentation, you know, things that you can use for your system. And one of them is head injury care. You can print this out and give it to your um, head injury patients if they refuse. Um, and you just hand it to them, go, hey, here you go. You, you may have had a head injury. You've declined. You can change your mind at any point. Please call 911 or go to the closest ER. Somebody should watch you for 24 hours. We do not wake these people up every two hours anymore because concussion patients need rest. You're waking them up every two hours, they're not getting any rest, okay? Now, if you have any of these things that we've just talked about, you need to call 911, okay? 
use this. Um, go into this document um, uh, area online on the New Hampshire website. Even if you're not from New Hampshire, you can cut and paste this and put it on your own heading if you want. Okay, but it's something you can send home with that patient because you got this guy that you're you think's got a concussion, and you're going to give them verbal directions. Remember, they might have problems with memory. Give them something that they can look at. Okay, so um, concussions um, versus head bleeds. Um, I hope that helps kind of clear some things up. We're going to take a uh, break here set up for part two and part two is uh, trauma assessment.